Well, hey, everybody, and welcome once again to Ancient Ways for Modern Days. My name is Mike Freeman. I'm the pastor at Valley Christian Fellowship in Longview, Washington. And we are almost to an end of our journey through the entire New Testament, looking devotionally at, at each chapter of the New Testament. Now, today we're in Revelation chapter 17. And uh, Revelation 17, uh, big picture, if we're going to get the, the big picture, there, there's a lot of imagery, there's symbolism, there's a lot going on here. But in Revelation 17 and then in Revelation, Revelation 18, you have Jesus conquering um, the, the religious side, uh, the, um, the evil, uh, I guess, religious false worshiping side of Babylon, and then the, the economic and political side of Babylon. So 17 and 18, kind of, they go hand in hand as we're continuing to understand these, these judgments that are poured out upon the earth. And uh, in this chapter, we're going to see the judgment upon this, this false worship that goes along with, uh, I guess we can call it a new world order, the, the, the Antichrist, the, the beast in his reign over the world. And it's a reign that is, that is uh, instead of or replacing or attempting to replace Christ, and it's an opposition to Christ. And what we find here is that Jesus comes uh, and, and we'll see that he conquers the, the false worship. Now, this is important because we have to remember that it is so easy for us to, to uh, slide into a kind of uh, worship of, of religious ideas or even to kind of like staple God's name onto things, but not actually worship in the way he calls us to and not know him based on who he is and, and who we are before him. See, sometimes worship becomes expedient. It becomes like, you know, uh, if we can line our worship up with different cultural practices or cultural ideas, and we can allow the two to kind of become combined, well, then, you know, it's like uh, killing two birds with one stone, right? Like, my religion uh, actually helps me socially or culturally, and that is so dangerous. And listen, the those... Uh, there are folks that do this that are what we would call on the the left theologically and those who do this that are on the the right theologically now both of them are dangerous both of them are are evil and and either of them could actually be uh, the expression that we ultimately will see when God ends up coming and judging the beast and what we're going to see is this false form of religion and so uh, let me let me ask you to turn with me. We're going to look at kind of all of Revelation 17. I'll try to be brief. There's a lot here, though. Uh, there, there's a lot worth considering. So Revelation 17, starting in verse 1, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on the many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. Now there's a lot there, right? But let's uh, let's keep going, and then we'll circle back to some of this. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten hordes. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abomination. Abominations, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I saw her, and I mar when I saw her, I marveled greatly. Now, this, uh, this interpretation, this woman is, she's on the beast. So she's aligned with the Antichrist. And she's, she's robed in the, these, these fine, uh, this fine attire. And uh, she, is, she is full of abominations. This is a false worship. Now, she, she, her false worship is aligned with sexual impurity and sexual immorality. But this is, this is who she is. And then we continue. I want to skip to verse 9. It says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. Now, th there's a, a sense here that we're being called to think deeply and think spiritually about these things. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, this is potentially, there's debate over this, but this is potentially referring actually to Rome and the, the seven hills of Rome. Is, Rome is kind of classically known as the, the seven hills. 
And in that, there is a, a strong possibility that this is referring to Rome, which we would see as the, the seat of, of false worship. And this is where the woman is seated. It says, uh, they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does, he must remain only a little while. This is potentially also talking about seven iterations of of the uh, maybe the the Roman Empire in the world. Um, this this force of um, dominance and and of power and of prestige. Verse eleven. As for the beast that was and and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Now, within the beast, the Antichrist, all of the kingdoms of the earth will be, uh, they'll be assembled under his rule and reign and his power, which is what we have there. Verse 12, and the 10 horns that you have, that you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So these are... Ten kingdoms, kings, and they kind of are almost like, uh, you know, almost like yes men. They they receive this power so that they can give it to the beast, this this uh, this antichrist, at the head of a a a global government that is ultimately in rebellion against the lamb. Look, look at verse fourteen. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen. And those with him are called the chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are the peoples and the multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they are the beast, they are, and the, so I'm sorry, and they're, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry this, carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. So here's what happens. Really, if I were to kind of say a snapshot view, here's what happens. This a woman, this false worship, not, not an actual woman, but this this false worship that the kings of the earth, that this, this global government, they align themselves with this, this false worship structure or, and that stands as a post or a, in opposition to Christ. She makes opposition. She's sexually immoral. It's a, it's a license uh, kind of uh, false religion. And, uh, and, she, this this religion is used by the beast and these kings, these nations to make a war against the lamb, thinking that, you know what, we'll conquer. You know what we'll conquer? We will conquer the, the, the king of kings and the lord of lords. We will conquer him with our own new um, brand of worship. Well, it fails. And when it fails, the, the antichrist, the beast, and these other kings, they turn upon her. And they devour her and they destroy her. See, uh, here's, here's our application. We can get into end times more and more and, and there's so much here to pull out and I think that this is kind of inspiring and, and thought-provoking. But, but, but here's where I want this to land as our ancient way for our modern day. Here, here's what it is. Oftentimes we think that if we compromise in our faith, we will end up with the approval of the world around us. If we, if we slide into liberal Christianity or, or if we, if we uh, kind of push hardcore into this, uh, this synchronism between uh, the religious right and Christianity, if we, if we go that direction, well, then, then you know what? That will, that will benefit us. But here's the deal. Anytime we compromise aspects of our faith for the approval or for power that comes from this world, anytime that happens, sooner or later, Sooner or later, it will turn on you. Whether it's compromising uh, into liberal ideas or where it's aligning Christian ideas with, with a re religious right political agenda that actually doesn't have Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, see there are errors both ways. Some errors might be more grievous than others. 
Uh, I think that the, the further we go into uh, a liberal idea of the Christian faith, that we just we just outright completely completely abandon Christian teaching. And, uh, those who lean toward toward the right, they uh, I wouldn't say they completely abandon Christian teaching, but they they they, they lose the point. And it becomes about this this world and the power that we can seek in this world. But here's the both end up riding the beast, and both end up getting devoured. See, see, the ancient way of our modern day is to allow the Bible to determine our values, to allow the Bible to, to determine our beliefs, and to be able to speak truth regardless of the uh, the political the economic and the social consequences we might face. We must let the Bible speak as God's word and not try to use the Bible to fit in to whatever group that we're drawn to be part of. You know, the reality is we live in such a polarized world right now. We live in such a polarized world where there are all sorts of different brands of Christianity, but brother and sister in Christ, the ancient way for our modern day what we learn is we as we look at this this judgment upon the false religion during the tribulation what we learn is false religion must be avoided and and true religion a, a true faith in Jesus as king of kings and lord of lords as the only substitute for our sin the one who sacrificed himself was buried and victoriously resurrected he is the only savior And we must worship him alone. I don't know where you find yourself on the political spectrum. I don't know where you find yourself on the theological spectrum. But but today, here's the call. The call is to forget the spectrum. And and to allow the ancient way of the word of God, the only way of Jesus Christ, to be the way we live in our modern day. This is our ancient way for our modern day.